critically, part five, inductive reasoning, science, and probability. We've talked a lot about science in the past and sort of figured that everyone knew what it meant. Well, now we're going to actually figure out what science is and how it works. And this will be the boring one, okay? All the other ones have been exciting. This will be totally boring. Let's think about our uh, objective here. We're going to be talking about thinking critically. Let's remember our definition. It's a mental process, so it is a verb, not a noun, that integrates the knowledge, skills, and strategies to promote improved problem solving, rational decision making, and enhanced creativity. Now, last month, we looked at this part two of uh, deductive reasoning, in which we looked at misleading, deceptive, and fallacious reasoning processes. We talked about confirmation bias. We talked about framing and word games and fallacious arguments and persuasion. This month we're going to talk about inductive reasoning, hypothesis <coughs> formation, probability, and science. Yay, science! Yay. Oh, well, everyone is cheering. Yay. 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 <laughs> now, we talked last time about the, the process of developing an argument where we had a series of uh, premises all leading to the support of a single conclusion. And we said, we can build logical relationships based upon these things. We can build a tower of logical relationships based upon our relationships that we've developed in the past through deductive reasoning. The question is, what happens when one of these premises goes wrong? When something doesn't work right, it's been discovered to be invalid. Well, our arguments fall apart. This is our house of cards, and it just collapsed all over us. So, what do we do when our conclusions are wrong? Or our premises are invalid, or we run out of facts? We can't build any more conclusions. We've run out of the, the, the premises. So we need to discover new facts, new relationships, new truths. We start by observing the world. We live in a world where things happen. When things happen, we really have two choices, either we need to understand them. I mean, the tiger is about to attack you. You do need to understand this. Or, we're curious about them. The northern lights are up there. What's going on here? So, we have these two things both working in the same direction that say, we need to look, we need to study, we need to make observations about our world. We need to find new facts, new information, and new knowledge to support new premises. I'm skipping a page here. You'll excuse me while I get pages put away. Ah, thank you. Our explanations must be organized. Many people must observe, and many observations must be made. Then, based upon all this accumulated evidence, we try to draw a conclusion based on the summation of all of the observations. This type of reasoning is called inductive reasoning. See, I caught up to my own slide. <laughs> Now, let's remember that our senses can be fooled. I mean, did we all see the gorilla? No. Uh, did we all see the change in people when the sign came between the questioner and the answering person? No. A, a six foot tall black man turned into a five foot five inch oriental woman, and they didn't observe it. This is the kind of thing that goes on. We often miss information presented to us, and we misinterpreted the things that we sense. So we need to think about hypothesis testing. That is, the process is called hypothesis testing. It's a basic aspect. It's the basis of science. We make observations. We conjecture about the causes and effects. Hmm, I wonder how that happened. We support conclusions based upon our conjectures. These are called arguments, as we know. However, conclusions of one argument lead to this if-then hypothesis, the conditional, and this hypothesis stimulates further investigations. Hypothesis testing is the basis of science. A conclusion is the consequence of premises within a valid argument. We test the conclusion by temporarily assuming it to be true or false. It's called the hypothesis at that point. We deduce logical or experiential consequences of this hypothesis. We test 
to the hypothesis and its consequences against observations, or we perform experiments to test the consequences. Based upon the results of these tests, we either support or refute the hypothesis. The moment we've done that, we go back to step one. Science is a recursive process. Where we're constantly going in, making new observations, making new conclusions, coming back to the beginning, and going around and around. We pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. And so we rebuild relationships. They don't have to collapse because we can find the new information for premises. As I said, hypothesis testing is the basis of science, and inductive reasoning is used to answer new questions through observations and or experiments. So the question is, if it's so powerful, if it's so good, why don't we use it all the time? Oh, it's horrible. It's really, really hard. It's tedious. It's probabilistic. You don't get true or false. You get, well, mostly true. And it can be woefully in incorrect, inaccurate, wrong. Uh, let's consider the experiment. Uh, and whether it's observational or empirical, regardless of that, um, the experiment that we're going to perform has to have four properties. Must have four properties. These four properties are accuracy, <coughs> precision, reproducibility, and repeatability. These are four things that we always see. Now, you use a lot of these words interchangeably. We in the sciences do not. These are sacrosanct. We know exactly what we're saying when we say these things. Accuracy. Accuracy is closer to the truth. There is a truth out there, and we're trying to measure it. Is it being measured to a mile? Essentially, we're saying, how many zeros are you making this measurement? How many zeros are you carrying out that measurement process? A mile. Uh, I chose an example, for instance, what would happen if I said, let's measure the coastline of the United States, and we'll put a peg in every mile down the coastline. Well, what will happen? We'll miss inlets, we'll miss peninsulas, we sort of cross cut it. Will this be a good, accurate measure of the United States? No. It will be accurate to one mile. What would happen if I take that exact same thing and do it to an inch? Will the coastline of the United States be longer? Oh, yeah. We won't count all those big, long things. If I said, let's do it to the millimeter, oh, this would be tedious, wouldn't it? <laughs> now, let's look at these last two numbers. I'm measuring to an accuracy of 0 0.00001 millimeter, or I'm saying it's 1.00000 millimeters. In terms of accuracy, they're the same. I'm measuring the number to five decimal points. Something that we don't normally consider in our regular vocabulary. Let's compare that to the scientific word precision. Precision is the closeness of the measurements themselves. If I say something is precise to a mile, 100 miles plus or minus one. Okay, so if I'm somewhere between 99 and 101, that's, that's okay. Um, a foot, plus or minus an inch. Okay. How about a hundred miles, plus or minus an inch? Oh, that's different. You really have to think about the accuracy of the measurement and how many, how well you're measuring every single time. Millimeter. Again, let's look at these last two numbers here. Plus or minus 0 0.0001 millimeters and 1.0000. Are they the same? not in terms of precision. They are different numbers. This one is being measured down to here. That's our precision. This is being precise to here with a high degree of accuracy. So again, in the sciences, we use words slightly differently, but we have to. We're communicating a very, very important measurement. Uh, let's think about our reproducibility. Oh, sorry. Here's a description that we can think about in terms of accuracy versus precision. A marksman fires 10 bullets into a target. All 10 bullets pass through the same hole, but the hole is three inches from the bullseye. We've been very, very precise, but we're inaccurate. Um, in terms of scientific instruments, for instance, 
we like to build an instrument which is precise and not necessarily accurate because like with the rifle if the rifle is precise I can calibrate the telescope <coughs> and so I can actually bring this into line and make sure that I'm always hitting the target the same way so we emphasize precision even though we talk about accuracy uh, this is an interesting one I ran into many years ago I worked for Perkinama and I was at a cocktail party one evening with the president of the company, who was Admiral Nimitz, the, the famous Admiral Nimitz of Midway, and the chief scientist who was involved with the building of this particular mirror. And they were talking to me about the precision to which they were creating this mirror. This mirror was incredibly precise. From one end to the other, three meters, the variation in this mirror was one wavelength. A wavelength. Not a moment, a wavelength. Wow, incredibly precise. Well, I'm an analytical chemist, so I ask the obvious question, what about accuracy? What did you do to make sure that the center of the, parab the parabola was the center of this mirror? And they kept talking to me about precision. And I said, so you haven't done anything for accuracy? And they sort of looked through the hole in my head. And I said, it won't work. I was just a flunky out here in the, the cornfields of Illinois selling scientific instruments, talking to perhaps the most famous war hero in American history, the president of the company for which I worked, telling him that this multi-billion dollar project wouldn't work. Well, I was told to mind my own damn business. When the HST went up, it didn't work. Yeah. Unfortunately, I could not go back to him and go, I told you so. Uh, we actually had to have a spacewalk. We put in a five mirror array that, because it was precise, we could calibrate it back into being accurate. And now the HST is a marvelous instrument that we use all the time. Reproducibility, an important feature. You have to be able to repeat the experiment and get the same results. You repeat exactly the same experiment and the results come out within the precision number. If that works, you go, hey, your results have been validated. They've been supported. If you can't do it, the study was wrong. You've got to go back all the way to ground zero and rebuild a new study because it's not holding together. Repeatability is similar but different. Uh, repeatability is the ability to look at the same set of physics, the same numbers, from a different perspective. If I come in a perspective like this, and you come in a perspective like this, and we're looking at exactly the same problem, we should both come up with the same number. If we don't, one or both of us is wrong. So we need accuracy, precision, reproducibility, and repeatability for any scientific experiment. Here's a marvelous example. This is the uh, Large Hadron Collider at CERN. There are seven experiments operating on that big circle. I'm going to think about two of these experiments, the CMS and the ATLAS. These are the two primary ex uh, experiments looking at the Higgs boson. The Higgs boson. These are the numbers that come up with. Notice the accuracy. 125.09 giga electron volts five numbers, 125.09. What was the experimental precision? Plus or minus 0.21 giga electron volts. What was the reproducibility? It has to be at least five standard deviations. Otherwise, they won't even pronounce it. They won't publish it. They won't say anything about it. Four is the minimum that you talk about. Five is the the minimum for which they'll reproduce. Can you talk, talk, what does it mean to have five standard deviations? That is, the difference between zero and the number they're getting is five standard deviations. That is, you know what precision is, what standard deviation is. So we've got it out so accurately, we know this number dead on, and we can say, this is not a zero, this is a non-zero number, it differs from all of them, <laughs> it's sitting right there, and we know exactly where it is, to five standard deviations. So that says, Roughly one part in 10,000. 
the, the Can chances. Can we go higher than that? Yes, but that's the minimum for which we will begin to think about publishing. So the chances of it being a random measurement or some error is the one in 10,000. Some other number than that yeah. are vanishingly small. So precision is essentially, the standard deviation simply says, what is the chance that I'm wrong? And the chances that we're wrong at that is about one in 10,000. Not very likely. And since then, this number has been stretched out in even more, more Z's, as it might be called. Also, look at the repeatability. We have two separate experiments looking at exactly the same phenomenon, coming in at exactly the same sets of numbers. This is, by the way, this precision here is the precision for the combination of these two detectors. So two separate experiments coming into this number with this. We get a good shot at it. This is a good, solid number. So whatever it is, and we're going we're gonna to name it the Higgs boson, that's where it is. Does it fulfill all the other requirements? And it turns out, yes. It fulfills all the other requirements of that particular boson. So when we run an experiment, we really have to consider a number of parameters. We need to know them. We need to control them whenever we perform any experiment. Let's take a look at them. The first one, this is us. Attention, change, and sensory blindness. The very first topic I gave was talked about attention, change in sensory blindness. But we didn't see the grill. We all saw these other things. Now, this says that we need a number of different observers in order to conduct these experiments. We have to test the observers for their sensory capability. Do we want people who are colorblind? Do we want people who are synesthetes? Do we want to eliminate them? If so, why? Um, if we do want to train these observers, if so, they're automatically biased. They're biased by their training. Do we want to have untrained observers? Well, if so, they're unskilled. They know what they're doing. Um, how many observers do we want? How many observations do we need before we begin to say, yeah, probably. It ends up it's quite a, quite a lot. Sampling. We can never test all, ever. When we talk about the population in the United States, we've got 330 million of us. We can't test all 330 million. So we try to get a number of people, bring them together that represents that. This is the sample. Is the sample large enough? Well, we can run a set of statistics and say, this is how many people we need. Uh, typically for a, a, a low standard deviation, uh, we need 1,800 to 2,000 people to uh, be a sample for the United States. The more accurate we want that to be, the more people we need. Um, the sample has to be representative of the population. Each member of the sample represents a segment of that population. And the proportion of representatives of the sample must accurately reflect the entire population which means we have to know the population first in order to know what is actually going on. Um, the selection of representative sample must be guided by statistically accurate knowledge of the population. We try to do this with a random sample. <coughs> Except a random sample is exactly that. We can't get it. There's no such thing as truly random. People will volunteer, or people might not volunteer, or you might ask the right people, or you might ask the wrong people. How do you get to make sure that your sample is in fact random, not a select group, maybe a self-selecting group? A lot of people don't want to get involved, right? We need to identify and control the variables. Oh, this is, this is a headache and a half. When we reproduce an experiment, it will always lead to slightly different results. This is a random error. That is, it's going to wiggle. There's going to be a little bit of wiggle room. We control random errors in two ways. We either isolate the experiment as much as we can within a laboratory or within controlled conditions. 
or we reproduce the experiment many times to develop a statistical mean and standard deviation. Now, what happens if our experiment is flawed and it automatically produces prejudicial conditions? They're going to lead to consistent but inaccurate results. These types of errors are commonly derived from either the methodology, the general approach, or the method itself. And it's called a systematic error. It's a built-in bias. Now, this is analogous to the uh, precision versus accuracy problem we just looked at. This is probably quite precise, but completely inaccurate. So an experiment can lead to these kinds of things. The solution, of course, is to identify the variables and eliminate it. Now, you just worked long and hard to develop this initial experiment. Well, you thought you'd eliminated all these errors. So how do you go back into it now and find out the error that you didn't know existed? Someone else has to come in and come back to you and go, did you think about this? So now we have a whole group of people involved in looking at this experiment. Systematic errors are a real pain. They're, they're difficult to work with. The method. How did you actually perform this experiment? Let's look at a basic method here. Here's a wonderful method for counting cows. Count the number of legs and divide by four. <laughs> <laughs> Works. So I find this method in the literature and I say, I'm going to apply this. This is a great method, I'm going to apply it. Except, I'm counting chickens. Well, I'm precise, but not very accurate. I built in an error. Is the measurement sensitive, valid, and reliable? This is one of those things we always chase. It's like a cat chasing its tail. We start out, we basically divide the world into qualitative versus quantitative analysis. Qualitative analysis says, I simply want to detect it. Is it there? If so, you might want a highly sensitive detection device. But you don't need a broad range. You need to say, it's there. So for instance, a phonomultiplier is a highly sensitive tool but it can easily be swamped. You get a cascade, just go, and there's all, so much going through there that you don't, can't measure anything. If it's a quantitative test, sensitivity is not as important. You need a broad range, which is calibrated across that broad range. So I can say, this is how much is there. Now, here's an example. If I look at this, this is a typical <coughs> signal to noise ratio of a typical detection device. This could be a human. This could be a photocouple. This could be a photomultiplier. Doesn't matter. Here's your detection limit. Twice the signal to noise ratio. I can detect it. It's there. I can reproduce this. It's there. How much? I have no idea. If I need to answer the question how much, I need to have at least a factor of three. That's a bare minimum to be able to say how much. Uh, in my own work, I won't work with something less than 10, and I prefer 100 if I can get it. This gives me the dynamic range I need to be able to look at a broad variety of things. So these are the kinds of things, again, we have to think about in terms of sensitivity and our instrumentation. Do the observations support the conclusions? An observer sees cars traveling down a road. Sees a red light, and the cars all stop. Cool. Light turns green, everybody goes. What's the conclusion? Red light stops cars, green lights repel them. <laughs> then somebody runs a red light. Yeah, do our observations support our conclusions? And there we are in that same problem. Have we conf confused correlation and causation? Here is a marvelous Here's the autism, and here's organic food sales. Here's our autism, here's our organic food sales. Notice that autism is caused by organic food sales. And look at the statistics here. This is a 99.71% coefficient of correlation. Whoa-wee, this is dead on. And we're saying it's, it's accurate to 0. 0.00001. 0.01% reproducibility. Wow. 
Um, what's the problem with this? <laughs> it's just not true. So correlation <laughs> is not the same as causation. Here's our old friend just confirming evidence. Um, when we look at disconfirming evidence, we're always looking for those things which say you're wrong. It's so easy to come up there and say, I'm right, I've run my experiment, I don't have to worry about anything else. And of course, that isn't how the world works. You have biased everything. In fact, you can bias this to the point that you have to ask the question, did the experimenter bias the results? Now, ideally, and this is an ideal which is never, ever, ever followed, the researcher enters into an experiment with expectations. <coughs> it is difficult, and many people tell you it's impossible, for the researcher not to bias the subjects, the condition, the method, or the results to support the biases. Generally, the researcher will provide a method and materials, train other people in specific techniques to be employed, and permit them to carry out the experiment without interference. Then, the researcher hands everybody else the results, and they perform the statistical analysis. Finally, the researcher comes together with a group of peers, and they analyze the data to come up with conclusions. Does this ever happen in the real world? Never. Well, perhaps at CERN there's a little bit of this, but no. This is not how the world works. All of us run our own experiments. So, when we look at this, inductive reasoning, it's hard to perform. You've got to sample it. You've got to have a method. You've got to have your methodology. You've got to have your experiment. It's difficult to control the samples, the variables. It's probabilistic. It never proves anything. We never use the word proof in science, ever. It is probably more true or less true. So, inductive reasoning is hard and inconclusive. So the question we have to ask is, if it's so difficult, and if it doesn't do anything, and if you can't prove anything, why do you use it? What good is it? And the real answer comes down here with this thing called a null hypothesis. It's easy to disprove. It's impossible to prove. The null hypothesis is the basis of scientific disproof. The researcher establishes a hypothetically directed related root uh, a hypothetical hypothesis related to the thesis being tested. The researcher designs a study to test the null hypothesis in the hopes of disproving it. If the null hypothesis is not statistically supported, then the thesis under investigation is supported. And, if the null hypothesis is statistically supported, then the thesis under investigated is invalidated. Sounds backwards, doesn't it? Why would we do such a thing? Well, again, it's impossible to prove anything with statistics, only that it's more probable, more likely. And it's easy to demonstrate that an hypothesis is not statistically supportable. So, what I'd like to do is take an example from my own <coughs> research to show you how this works. Uh, this is my uh, critical thinking research. Uh, before I did anything, uh, there was this open question as to whether or not people can learn to think critically. And there was nothing in the literature that said one way or the other. A lot of people arguing. My question was, which is true? Can people or cannot people learn? No convincing research at all. So I chose my method and methodology based upon that of the leading experts. I chose, uh, for instance, Diane Halpern's book as my text. I looked up the best way of performing an analysis of this kind and followed it right from the book. So I took all the experts and that was the basis of everything I did. Then, and only then, I put together my null hypotheses. And here they are. There are three of them. People cannot learn to think critically. Okay? So I didn't want to, to test whether they could. I wanted to find out whether the hypothesis they cannot was correct. They can't be taught to think. They cannot transfer the thinking into other aspects of their lives. <coughs> so I started out with a standardized test of critical thinking before the semester even began 
and then a similar one, the identical one, in fact, afterwards. So what happened? Here's what happened. Basically, it says that the class average, the mean, was in the 35th percentile. Uh, roughly a third, so roughly two-thirds of all people were better critical thinking thinkers than the people in this particular class. After class, they were average. Wow, we've gone from well below average to average. So what could we conclude? Well, the best conclusion we come up with at that point was students learned. They were better. Students don't not learn. We'll, we'll get to that. <laughs> yeah, exactly, though. Exactly. And so, what we had done, we had begun building a structure. Here's my gap of ignorance that I was trying to bridge. Here's the, uh, the fundamentals that I had worked so hard to establish. Here's our tests. And here's the relationship. We'll see, we have the beginning. <coughs> we have the beginnings of some way of getting across this gap of ignorance. Now, this is not a real good one. You can do it, but it's, it needs some more, doesn't it? It's, it's really hard. So what we did is we have a test at the beginning of and at the end of every chapter. So we had a full content test. In the process of nine chapters, in each and every chapter, we found st significant statistical improvement in the after class as compared with the before class. So again, this simply showed and, and helped to validate the idea that our students had learned. And so we ended up with this kind of a bridge across our gap. Here's our major test. Here's each one of the chapter tests. And notice we now can cut all the way across that gap of ignorance. So our conclusion, students learn to think critically. That was what we concluded as a result of the basis of our research. <clears throat> Do the student, okay, the question becomes, how? We taught a critical thinking course as part of another course. Would the students have learned the same critical thinking skills if they hadn't been subjected to this new and different form of uh, course? Would they have learned it anyway? So the only thing we could do was run another series of experiments. We had two experimental classes. Again, as we show, 35 percentile before, 51 percentile after. We had a control class where nothing was taught about critical thinking. It was just a standard regular class, 35 and 35. There was no change. Yay, no change. Had there been a change, it would have been exciting. So what was our conclusion? Students can be taught to think critically. But do they retain it? Or is this like most other courses where you go through the, the 14 weeks of the semester and on the 15th week you have forgotten everything about it? So we went back and we did a five-year study. We sent out quantitative quantitative surveys to as many students as we could find. We asked about their use of critical thinking in their daily life, their academic life, and their business life. Now, this is the scientifically approved incomprehensible matrix, which is the mainstay of any scientific presentation. <coughs> would you like some better data? Here we go. Here's what it really says. <coughs> When I take a look at this, and I look at the statistics, in terms of their personal lives, on a seven-point scale, where four is the mean uh, of all of those values, my students <coughs> came up with a 5.8. They were way outside of the mean of the exam, and suddenly they're putting up a 5.8. So they're 1.8 units off on a seven-point scale. So you, you, you gave some kind of test that measured the... Yes, yeah, so the seven-point scale. Okay. Uh, and essentially, it's the, the middle number was neutral. So it's good, better, best, bad, worst, worst. So 3.5 three would have been right in the middle? Four. Okay. 
So, four is in the middle, five, six, seven. Oh, it starts with zero. Three, two, one. Okay. okay. And so we can simply, this is a ridiculous number. This is the, uh, the Z number. How good is this standard deviation? How reproducible was it? Uh, and here's my probability of error. The probability of error is so large that we can't measure it. All we can do is say it's very much less than 0 0.0001. So that's 0.001%. Uh, is this, a, this is about a part per million? Yeah. So That's the chances that your results were just because of random flukes, right? Correct. Okay. Essentially, it's the, the probability that my answers are wrong. Boy. And this is saying, of course, that it's highly reproducible. The number is evident. Comparison with 4 being the mean of mm -hmm. the entire test, this 5.8 is absolutely solid. Academic lives. Now, this number is less because not all students went on to get to a master's or a PhD. So, we had fewer people. Now, notice that, again, 5.2. My Z statistic here is 3.47. Uh, our probability of error is 0 0.0002. Uh, in terms of their professional lives, <laughs> did, did they actually use this stuff in their professional life? Again, 5.24, standard deviation. Here's the Z. The Z is 4. Again, a really solid statistic. This is, this, this is standing good. Notice our probability of wrong, 0.003% probability that we're wrong. These are almost silly statistics. That is silly in the, that they're so, so leaning in this positive. When we aggregated the numbers, uh, we came up with a mean of 5.16 for all of the numbers, for all the people, out of 7. The standard deviation of 1.6. The z-score was 12. That is, the people, all of them, came together as a group. And this is the kind of number they come up with. So it's a big, huge peak. It's ridiculous. It's, it's, a, it's a silly statistic. If you said you put up the z to any statistician, they would laugh. Can't have it. So this is just, a, this is just mathematics. The probability, thank you, Rachel. The probability is 0. 0. 0. That is, like part per million, part per ten million. So, statistically, really, really unlikely. So, what did I conclude from that? That students transferred their critical thinking skills, knowledge, and strategies from the classroom into their personal, academic, and business lives. So, what about the null hypotheses? Well, here are null hypotheses, and what can we say about them? The first one, people cannot learn. Well, we just showed that they could. What about this one? They cannot be taught to think. Wrong. We just showed they could. And this one? They will not transfer. Wrong. Again. We just showed that they could. So this is the purpose of the null hypothesis. It's essentially a straw man. If you can't knock down this straw man, then the straw man is a lot stronger than you think it is. So, given the experiment, the condition, the sample, and the limited number of experiments, what did I conclude? These are my three conclusions. Critical thinking can be taught. We can teach people to think critically. Critical thinking can be learned. People can learn to think critically. And that they will transfer this into their business, academic, and professional lives. This is what is called the <laughs> education. If this didn't work, then education is a failure. We might as well just stop. What is the whole process of education? We teach people how to do something read, write, anything. That's And if they carry it out into their lives, like you and I could read, we could talk to each other. School works. Duh. Is this true? Maybe. Hmm. And that's about the best we can come up with. What's the problem? What was wrong with my research? Oh, let me count the ways. It was done in one university, in one college of one university, in one state, in one country. It was a poor sample. 
It was the available people. They were self-selecting. These are the people who took this particular course of study. They were pre-selected. I did no selection. Is this representative of the people of the United States? No. Is it representative of the college population? No. It is the whole sample of those people who took that particular course of study. What about the methodology? Well, the experts said that this should work. You like the way I came out? Is that the positive? The experts said it should work. Uh, what about the method? Did I teach it well? Well, I taught it personally. So did I put my emotions into it? Well, darn too, I did. Did I bias it? Sure. This experiment has not been reproduced. We have no idea. If Mike's work cannot be reproduced, then it's flawed. Now, I'm going to actually come back on this and say a little bit. Actually, it was reproduced. It was reproduced for five years by another teacher in this same college. And that's where we get this five-year study. We got about seven, six or seven years of people going through this class, learning this stuff. So, can we say that it was not reproduced? Uh, yeah. No, it's a problem still exists up here. Well, it's not repeated using other methods. Yeah, someone else should use some different method, some different methodology, and approach the same problem. Now, if many different methods all work towards helping people become better critical thinkers, then we prove as much as we can ever prove anything in science that you can do this. That critical thinking is something that we can acquire as human beings. Um, the solution? We're going to do all this stuff. We have to reproduce all this stuff. And if we don't... So, anyone out there going for a doctor? Here's something you do. Reproduce my study. What about the... Is that questionnaire, the, however you use to assess their critical thinking skills, um, is that something that could be varied as well? Oh yes, absolutely. Um, it was a, a quantitative survey, and it was based upon the idea that they'd only taken my critical thinking course, so we asked them about how they were doing things, how they were applying it in their business lives, their personal lives. We expected them to come back with a similar verbiage to what we had given to them. If they did, we said, yep. And if they didn't, we no, that's not right. So we were very, very tight on that. They had to come back with similar verbiage to the kind that, that they had learned in the classroom. Like identify logical fallacies or something like that. Um, we were never getting to logical fallacies. It was how you actually did accomplish things. So when you describe how you did things, how you worked out a problem, how you worked out a dilemma, how you worked out something else, if you used the methods that we had taught, you went, yes, okay. we got through. And if, you, if they didn't come through with anything, if there, there was no answer there, then we just we had to ignore it. Um... So will this prove the critical thing if they do reproduce all this stuff and everything else, will it prove? No. Once again, in the sciences, um, we can either get stronger or weaker conclusions. We can never prove anything. Ours is always a, a statistical model. So ultimately, science uses the inductive reasoning process to develop and test hypotheses, from which conclusions are developed to support a theory. A theory is a thoroughly tested and comprehensive model of a phenomenon. In fact, this is one of my pet peeves. The indiscriminate use of the word theory. You hear this on television, you hear this on the radio, people talking about, I just have this wonderful theory. In science, theory is the biggest word we have. It is the explanatory word, it's the model by which we describe a phenomenon. There isn't anything like it. In fact, in, in the sciences, there's only probably 10 real theories. There are no theories in any of the social sciences at all. Zero. And that's because they all deal with people and people. You have to start out with something which is standard, and there's no such thing as a standard human being. Other than me, of course. So, a theory. 
must have these four properties. Must. Cause, effect, mechanism, and modification. We must be able to say, this is the cause of a phenomenon. This is the effect of it. Here's the mechanism by which that phenomenon occurs, and this is how we can modify it. There's also a second set of words which we can use. We can talk about predict, explain, analyze, and amelioration. For instance, if I said to you, avoid rhinoviruses, if you come in contact and are infected by a rhinovirus, you'll have this horrible thing at your nose, and your eyes will start to water, and your head will hurt, and you just feel miserable. For about two, you just be, oh, you're sneezing and you're coughing, and so don't get, don't become infected with a rhinovirus. Prediction. You come to me, and you go, I feel terrible. I got a ruddy dose of my eyes are running like that. And, then, oh. and now I can say, I can explain. You have a rhinovirus. They're the two halves of the same coin, aren't they? I can predict and explain. Analysis. Oh. What do I know about viruses? What do I know about the human ability or to, to fight them off? Or what happens to the consequence of infection? All this becomes the analysis of it. Amelioration, can I go back in there now and do something to make that cold go away, to change that virus, to change the human being so it doesn't catch that cold? No. Viruses are still bigger than us. So I don't have a good theory about rhinoviruses and catching colds. We're working on it, though, aren't we? We're working on how to cure the common cold. Now, the development of a theory takes enormous amounts of time, lots of effort by lots of people. And I wish to... Let's think about the origin of humans and the theory of evolution. Is it really a theory? Let's start with uh, John Ray. Now, let's look at the date here. Here we are, we're talking 17th century. Uh, John Ray rejected the system of uh, Aristotle's with the dichotomous this or that type of thing, that you're either red-blooded or you're not, and the whole pyramid and everything else. And he's the fellow who came up with the word species to describe an individual kind of animal. He didn't say kinds, so he objected to the biblical definitions of that. So. Way back then, we're beginning to come up with the word species. Carl Linnaeus. Why do we call ourselves Homo sapiens? Why do we have genus and species? Because Carl Linnaeus, way back here in the 18th century, developed the entire process, the entire hierarchy of kingdoms and orders and suborders and all the way down through genus and species. So when we talk about these things, we say thank you to Carl Linnaeus. He's the guy that put all of this nomenclature together. And he's the one who said, humans are primates. Let's think about Pierre Morteau. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to screw this up because I don't know French. Morteau, I assume. Uh, he proposed that natural modifications occur during reproduction and accumulate over many generations to produce a new species. So this is the first idea of natural modifications occurring during reproduction. Jim Hutton. Ah, the famous Scotsman. He is the guy who invented geology. He was the one who went out there and discovered looked at the earth itself and said, the earth is really old. It didn't start in 4004 BC. The earth is millions, if not billions of years old. And it, everything was created by means of a natural process over geologic time. And he's the fellow who began thinking about deep time. Uh, so he began only talking about deep time but also Plutonism, Informatism, and his writings anticipated the Gaia of Hypothesis. Brilliant. 
Erasmus Darwin. Now this is Charles Darwin's grandfather. And noted for this famous quote, let me read this to you. This, this is stunning. Would it be too bold to imagine that in the great length of time since the earth began to exist, perhaps millions of ages before the commencement of the history of mankind, would it be too bold to imagine that all warm-blooded animals have arisen from one living filament, which the great first cause endued with the animality and with the power of acquiring new parts, attended with new propensities, directed by irritations, sensations, volitions, and associations, and thus possessing the faculty of continuing to improve by its own inherent activity and of delivering down those improvements by generation to its posterity world without end. Wow. If that does not embody all of evolution, I don't know how to say it better. The man had a gift of words. Now, this is Darwin's grandpa. Of course, we should always think about uh, Tom Malthus. Here we are in the early 19th century. And of course, this is the entire idea that we have a competition going on between uh, growing food and a growing population. There are two conflicting areas here which are always going on. And in fact, this is what we can call economics at its basis. And so this has a direct effect upon us. Charles Robert Darwin. Most of us stop, start and stop right here and say, aha, evolution. Now, he's really, really, really important. And we've got to remember his uh, explorations down in the Galapagos and looking at speciation and that kind of thing were critical. His uh, drawings in his book showing lines of speciation. Again, critical. Uh, also, 1858, an important paper, both he and uh, Alfred Russell Wallace joined together to give this paper to the Linnaean Society, one of the first real discussions in a scientific uh, body about evolution, speciation, and that kind of thing. And of course, in 1871, the descent of man. Evolutionary descent with modification as a dominant scientific explanation of diversity. The Forgotten Man, Alfred Russell Wallace. While uh, Darwin was out in the Pacific and the Galapagos, and then came back to England, Russell Wallace was down in Australia. And he's the fellow who looked at mm -hmm the Wallace line, and discovered the Wallace line, which is the differentiation between the Australasian animals and the Asian animals. And he's the fellow who looked at speciation based upon isolation. A single species gets split into two isolated groups, becomes two species. And it was this discussion and his writing to Darwin that led directly to Darwin writing The Descent of Man. Uh, Gregor Mandel, the forgot another forgotten man. Remember his experiment with the peas, the green ones and the yellow ones? Combine them, there would be one group of yellow and three groups of green. But when he took the green, one group of the green became green and the other became green and yellow. Ah, so he was the fellow who figured out the genetic ruling of Mendelian inheritance. Unfortunately for Gregor Mendel, very shortly after he concluded his experiments, everyone forgot about it. And it went away. Um, he did, however, talk about genes as dominant and recessive genes. So our whole idea of dominant and recessive genes comes from his work. And he called them factors, but we now call them genes and they predictably determine the traits of an organism. So we can actually take the mathematics and look at how things work and go, ah, Mendelian inheritance. 
August Weissman, evolutionary biologist. He's the fellow who, dis who was involved in the germ plasm theory, also known as Weissmanism. Inheritance takes place via germ cells, not somatic cells. It takes place in the sex cells. It does not take place in the regular cells that make up the rest of our body. Thus, inheritance. Oh. Hugo de Vries, uh, one of the very first geneticists, he was the fellow that rediscovered Mendelian genetics and began to apply it to mutation theory. Genes can be changed, and those properties are inherited. Here we are, beginning to approach the 20th century, finally. Ronald Aylmer Fisher, uh, <laughs> described as a genius who almost single-handedly created the foundation of modern statistical science. He began applying statistics to the whole area. Uh, He's mathematics and statistics genius is a major contribution to what we're going to call the modern synthesis. And you're going to see a lot about this thing called the modern synthesis. Uh, he also did some major experimental work in, in agriculture, uh, which really is important for uh, the development of new species and better, uh, especially wheat and corn. Uh, this fellow, you, you have to look up John Haldane. Um, this is an, we could spend the whole term, whole hour, talking about this one man. He did incredibly important in, in this field. Uh, his first paper in 1915 demonstrated genetic linkage in mammals, while subsequent works helped to create population genetics, establishing the mod modification of Mendelian genes and Darwinian evolution by natural selection, laying the foundation for the modern evolutionary synthesis. He's the one who also put together the physical model of the chemical origins of life. And just a brilliant man. Ah, Julian Huxley. This is the fellow who finally put it all together. He's the one who assembled everything around and put together the modern evolutionary synthesis. And this is about uh, the time of World War II when he did this. And speaking thereof, here it is. This is the origin of species according to the modern. Notice we have three different headers here. On this side we have Malthusian competition, uh, we have geometric uh, population growth, limited resources. Here we have variations, that is the existing variations right now, breeds, races, species, subspecies. And over here we have the small individual changes of mutation. And he's the fellow began putting this together. He said, look, if we put these two together, we begin to get natural selection, the so-called survival of the fittest. But, let's look here at mutation, we get genetic variation and Mendelian inheritance. When these three are combined, we have what's called the modern synthesis. And this was the, the way it looked right up until 1953. When these three people, and well, I want to point out, Jim Watson, Francis Kirk, and Roz Franklin, the forgotten woman, who actually did put together the model for the structure of DNA. Here we are. DNA explains everything. Uh, it's the molecule of life and inheritance. We looked at chromosomes now. We can look at genes. We can look at eukaryotypes. We can look at circular chromosomes. We can put the whole thing together of uh, genes, inheritance, mutation, everything you wanted to know, and in one convenient little package. I bring in Theodorus, uh, again, an important scientist. I don't want to say that he's not important, but perhaps the thing which he's most noted for is this quote right here. Nothing in biology makes sense, except in the light of evolution. A brilliant insight. Curiosity and need led to inductive reasoning and investigation of the origin of the species and the evolution of mankind. Armed with facts, other researchers could deduce hypotheses. 
which are then tested empirically. And around and around we go. From inductive reasoning to deductive reasoning and back. We go around and around and around this circle. You can't simply have inductive reasoning. Sooner or later, you're going to apply it to deductive reasoning. And sooner or later, your deductive reasoning is going to run out, you're going to have to do inductive reasoning. And we go around and around and around, and it's constantly. And we flip back and forth, even within single sentences or paragraphs of our own talk, between discovering new information and drawing conclusions from it. It's a basic feedback loop. Where does this get us? This was from 23andMe. What 770,000 tubes of saliva re reveal about America? They were able to look at the populations of people, where they came from, and where they went to over time. As we can see, we have several different groups here. If we look up in this group in the Northeast in Utah, this is two to six generations ago. 99,000 people. Notice they start out here and begin to move across the country. And they continue to move across the country. They end up in Utah. The Pennsylvania group. All these little blue dots. They come across here and they come across and they end up here in uh, Kansas and Nebraska. Right here we have the lower Mississippian. And we see them coming up through West Virginia, southern Illinois, Missouri, and down into Arkansas. Here's the lower Appalachians. Again, the big purple group coming down here into Texas. And the southern group coming down here into Louisiana and Texas. We can trace where people started from and where they went to by their genetics. You have some Arcadians there. Oh, thank you for pointing that out. The Arcadians, of course, came from here. They're Canadians. And they ended up, of course, in Louisiana, which gives us that interesting uh, mix there. Why are these French people down there? Well, they came from French Canada and ended up down here. What's the next thing we do with our study of genetics? We look at the peopling of the, of the world. Where did we come from? Where did we go to? We can see the out of Africa hypothesis here with some groups going up into Europe. Whoops. Back up. Uh, some groups coming in through Northern Europe, through the Arles. Notice the different groups here. We have this group coming down here, which splits out. This group coming up here, which splits out. This group coming up here, which splits out. There are three different routes that are being used. And a fourth route, possibly over the Pacific Ocean. How did people get to the New World? Well, they walked, they took boats, they did all sorts of things to get here and we can trace them and we can figure out exactly who they are and what's going on. And who's this? Well, let's look at this person. Uh, dark skinned, blue eyed, wavy hair. Cheddar man. This is the first Briton. This is a fellow who 10,000 years ago died in Somerset in the Cheddar Gorge. Uh, if we were to see him alive today, we would say that he was black. Now, there's something back in my tiny little brain that I have not researched recently. I, I, I hope someone does. I remember something in Irish folk legends or something along that line about the black fairies being driven out of Britain. 10,000 years ago, the people of Europe were dark-skinned. 12,000, 15,000 years ago. We have to ask interesting questions. Where did us light-skinned people come from? How did we get there? Where did the freckled people come from? We're different. All of this is modern genetics. And then this is ripped out of the newspapers today. Uh, at the University of Alabama, UAB researchers using gene therapy for determining, uh, for eliminating, counteracting frontotemporal dementia. Oh my goodness. We're using our knowledge to change human genetics. Right here, 
CART T-cell therapy approved for young adults and stuff with beta cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia. We're using genetics to fight disease. Application of CRISPR could end sickle cell disease. We know that sickle cell disease is genetic. And yet we're going back into humans, live human beings, and changing the genetics. Uh, this was very recent, March 7th. Synesthesia. We talked about synesthesia in the very first one. And we know that it's a, a, a that the cells that involve different senses are somehow communicating with one another. Well, it's a strong indication also that there's a genetic basis to this. If there's a genetic basis, what do we know about it? What can we do about it? Should we do something about it? <laughs> and so, what have we done? Do we know the cause of evolution? Can we look at our own DNA and say, this is how we evolve? Yeah, done it, been there, done that. Do we know the effects of evolution? Ta-da! Here I am. Do we understand the mechanism of evolution? Yes. And can we now go back into the DNA molecules which are us, our, our gene, modify them in such a way that we can change, modify, and improve the human species? Yeah. Do we actually know what we're doing? We're getting pretty darn good at it. Really good at it. Science uses the inductive reasoning process to develop and test hypotheses and to draw conclusions leading to the development of theory. A long, involved, and difficult process, often taking centuries. We stand on the shoulders of giants and get the truth. What's next? Nobody knows. We're inducing, we're deducing, we're moving on. To what end? Nobody knows. Well, I have a question for you about the science. Um, did you want to turn the camera back on? It's on. Okay. Yeah. Um, the theory of evolution, do you think it is un, it, it's inappropriate? to say that it was a theory before the discovery of DNA. I know that's one of the things that really bothered Charles Darwin is he didn't know the mechanism of inheritance and how what we now know of as mutations, how those happen. Is it fair to call it a theory or was it just a hypothesis until... Until we did DNA, it was a hypothesis. It, and it, of course it went beyond that. It, we could really say it was a thesis. Hmm. So we, we had not gone to the point of theory, but we were able to say, uh, we could do the first three. We could do these first three right in here. Um, before Darwin, this one was the tricky one. But once we got this, and we could see the chemistry, mm -hmm. and it just came down to basic chemistry, we could go, ah, chemistry I can do. Now, how do I manipulate this big, huge, long molecule in such a way that I don't destroy it, that I don't destroy the, the, the beast which it's going to become, and tweak it so that I improve it without destroying it. And, of course, that's what we're doing right now. That's the key. And this was the final step we needed in order to us, for us to, to really say that this is a, a, uh, a no. true theory. And again, uh, we, we thank Rachel. <laughs> thank you, Rachel. <laughs> she loves this topic. See, DNA, it gets to everyone. Everyone loves it. So yeah, we can understand why Charles Darwin was so conf so concerned. Because with, without a mechanism, without this part right here, all he had was these two, and a guess. Mm -hmm. He had Grandpa's really good guess. And Grandpa was a wise man. But we couldn't get beyond it. Okay. And that's one of the problems I have with, with theory. Most people will get to, get into here and say, oh, I got a great theory. No, you don't. <laughs> you, got, you could have a guess. Yeah, the mechanism is often lacking. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah. And again, the problem of, of correlation versus uh, proof. Right. Uh, and again, using the word proof in science, of course, is not something we try to do. 
it's avoided at all costs? Because it it's, must it's used colloquially, but as scientists are often very careful to say this this is consistent with. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, we have evidence. Yeah. Um, we have good statistics. You see all these these things, but we never ever ever say proof. That's 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 a word that is not in our vocabulary. Yes. And it's kind of a sloppy word in a, in a scientific it's sense. Scientific. But mathematicians talk about proof. Oh yes. This. But again, mathematics is a is a pure. Yeah. Is the ultimate in pure. Even things like chemistry and physics aren't yes. pure. Not like like yeah. mathematics. Because mathematics is, can be a closed system, right. whereas physics, we don't know what that system is. We're still exploring it. There's a marvelous universe out there about which we know absolutely nothing. We got we got bits and pieces, and we're learning. We're getting good at it. Our chemistry, we're quite good at chemistry, because we have these marvelous things called atoms. And the moment it's an atom, it's the same throughout the cosmos. And whatever we do here, we can do there. So. Chemistry is, is probably one of the sciences that we really have the most confidence in. And we can apply this chemistry to biology, as we do here. It's a, it's oh, a, yeah. we win. So it starts with physics, to chemistry, to biology, and then to things that are so complex, we don't really have any theories about them, we just describe yeah. them. Uh, when we try to develop theories of humans, we fail instantly. Because, again, when we start with chemistry, all carbons are the same. So if I say I'm doing this experiment with carbon and doing it with hydrogen, doing it with oxygen, all of us will always come up with exactly the same results because all the carbons are the same. If I start out with any group of people and perform an experiment, it'll go to hell the second or third time we try it. It just won't work because people are such variables. And not only do we are we variable as a group, genetically, socially, and every other way, but we're changing constantly. Uh, let's look at the most recent things now. We have 17, 18 year old kids out there involved in politics. Will the political system be modified because of these children? Yeah, it can't help but be modified in some way, greater or lesser. And so what will happen to this society? We will change. And so we are a constantly changing group. How do you come up with anything that's solid? Nothing. So people talk about theories of education. The well, you best, proved that we can learn. Well, no, I, I, I proved nothing. Well, you, right, you didn't prove. You no. found <laughs> you found <laughs> statistical evidence indicating that yes. people can be taught critical thinking skills. And, and people can learn it, mm. and people can be taught it, and that they will actually carry out some of the features of it and, and incorporate it in their lives. Um, and again, if education is a real thing, then it should work all the time. Does it? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you.